today. Please welcome Manila. Thank you. Oh, the clicker. Great. Am I on? Yeah, you can hear me. I'm going to use this um, just because I have some technical stuff that I don't want to miss, and I don't want to misstate anything. Um, so thank you for that introduction. I, every time I hear it, I think I should really rewrite my bio, but um, it, that was well executed regardless. Um, so I am Manila Austin. I'm from Communispace. I'm going to talk about how to actually uh, deliver quality of insight, quality insights at the speed of business. Uh, in my role at Communispace, I've spoken with over 50 clients at this point in the last few years about how to really derive business impact from the work we do, from the insights. And, you know, they mentioned a lot of things. They, uh, Melanie Courtright talked about it. You know, she said it's time to know what we know. That was a major theme. We, where we suffer from information overload. And, um, and you know, we, we overly focus perhaps on data collection, just reflexively asking more questions when the knowledge, we may already have a great deal of it. Uh, actually engaging stakeholders in the insights and kind of inspiring action was another huge barrier to impact that clients discussed. And um, this was another big theme, um, which is why I'm giving this presentation today. And it's also, uh, we've written a paper that will be available on our website tomorrow, which is also the topic here. So you can reference that if you want more information. But um, one of the things that really gets in the way for creating, of creating impact is the fact that uh, market researchers often don't move fast enough. And we can't gather and sort of understand and communicate the insights fast enough uh, to actually you know, meet the, piece, uh, the pace of business. One of uh, the clients I interview, uh, interviewed said, you know, insights are, are ephemeral. They're actually perishable. And sort of like these drawings on the sand. This is an artist who works out of a San Francisco Bay Area and creates these patterns in the sand and also in ice and things like that. And the weather takes them away. They're designed to uh, disappear. Insights, though, really should have a longer shelf life than the turning tide. And But like um, the ocean, the world that we live in is ever-changing and extremely dynamic. So how do you, in fact, bring insights to the business when times change so quickly? I mean, I think we've had a lot of you know, talks this morning that kind of address some of that. Um, but the, the essential problem is something we're still grappling with, for sure. So another client you know, said to me, by the time you net it out, the business has moved on to a new problem. We need to move decisively with good enough information. Um, and I think that it's, it, this decisive, decisiveness depends on a couple, a couple of factors to really help us be decisive. One of them is the, the issue of confidence. We can't move quickly if we're not confident that what we have is quality information or if it's just taking absolutely too long to get it. So, um, you know, when this client made this quote, you know, I put the confident in air quotes because I think that's really how he intended it, which was ironically. Um, he's saying that we need to think differently about quality than we did before so that we can, you know, ride the rapids and actually be fast and speedy. So online communities should be a terrific resource for this. You know, once you've made the investment in an online community, you have this always-on resource that allows you to collaborate very flexibly and creatively with customers. You know, Communispace has been in this business for a long time. We've built and developed over 700 communities, worked with hundreds of clients, and we've definitely seen this borne out in practice that this is true. Um, particularly if you design the community well so that you've got the right group of people assembled uh, to solve a very specific business problem. Uh, but we still struggle with actually using them to our greatest advantage. And that's not, you know, we want to see our clients get the most value out of them. Um, and, and one of the reasons that people struggle sometimes to figure out what do I do with this information is we try to put in a bucket. Well, is it qualitative or is it quantitative? Right? And it's a perfectly reasonable question. Um, I certainly had the same question when I came to Communispace 10 years ago. Um, but one of the things we found is that even though communities really do, they really were born from the humanistic tradition, which means essentially qualitative, the fact that they are on a large scale, and even if you're talking only 150 people, that's still a large scale. Uh, you can quantify things a little bit and well enough and fast enough and nimbly enough in them to kind of provide that comfort and that validation and that confidence to move forward and make decisions quickly. Um, so um, this, is, this is not meant as a refresher course. <laughs> this is more just to make a point. So when I first started thinking about how to use you know, communities as a research methodology, I went back to my textbooks uh, and actually looked at sort of what were the threats to validity. And, and in general, you know, communities kind of break the rules. Because you know, we don't know if they're qualitative or quantitative, what happens is the very things that we normally control for, um, you know, 
a non-representative, um, sort of a representative or uncontrolled research setting, among them sort of the very peculiar demand characteristics of, of the research setting, which are online communities. These things create the very things that normally we would try to actually control for or try to eliminate in a traditional study. But what we found in our experience is that a lot of these things actually strengthen the quality of the data and can create confidence in ways that are different than statistical confidence, but equally important, and I think in this day and age, equally valid. So um, for example, the representativeness of the research context, the fact that it's real, it's in people's homes, it's integrated into their real life, just makes it all that more immediate and sort of capturing something that you couldn't try to approximate in a laboratory or through a survey. Uh, Real-time research means temporal effects are eliminated almost altogether. The high engagement, um, Melanie was talking about sort of losing, losing participants, but not when you have a community. The engagement is high, so that actually wards against that. And also, a lot of you know, knowing who's asking, knowing that you're being observed, knowing that the purpose of the research and sort of why you're contributing actually makes the data more focused and useful and when you engage people as partners. So, um, that's, so I think there's a lot of ways actually to use online communities uh, to build confidence and to move quickly. I'm going to show you a couple examples that we've used uh, with clients in recent years to help them do this. They fall generally into three buckets. The first is about just sort of when you want to explore uh, data and sort of kind of surface patterns. You know, you can also use them for validating insights and for quick feedback. And you know, you can pull all these methods together and actually go through a whole product or concept development process, oftentimes saving time and money and steps uh, if you use the community well. And um, if you want pay copies of the paper, um, my colleague Julie Wittischlack is speaking at 4.40 tomorrow in this room. Um, she's also got a great example of using communities in a similar way. So if you like the topic and want to learn more, I encourage you to do that. Right, so the point is all of these techniques I'm about to show you can work when the sample size is small and specific and, um, and to build confidence and make decisions quickly. What I'm showing you here is actually an example of a text analytics output from a tool that we use called Luminoso. I, I apologize that it's not actually dynamic, but when you use the tool, it is. So you can actually see these word clouds, which are much more sophisticated than a regular word cloud. They actually, the colors of the words and the closeness of the words and the various sizes of the words actually indicate strength of relationship within, um, within sort of the data set. What this is is 10,000 verbatims pulled from a bunch of communities for one of our retail grocery clients. And what they wanted to understand is the emotional connection to their brand versus the competitors. Uh, and what we found before even starting our sort of like top-down analysis, when we just looked at what was bubbling up, we noticed right away that certain word, kinds of words were associated with the client's brand and other kinds of words were associated with their competitors. So for example, the competitive brand, the competitive grocery stores had all sorts of food-related options items, bakeries and groceries, and it was around Thanksgiving, so a lot of stuff related to cooking, um, holiday meals. When you want to what was associated with our client's brand, it was things like coupons and bags and checkout, very transactional. Um, so this was a really unexpected insight that we never would have gotten had we not opened ourselves up to sort of exploring patterns in this broad way. And being able to play and dynamically move um, the data around to see these connections brought it to life and made us feel much more confident that this was worth bringing to the client. Because not only could we see the patterns and kind of recreate them, but uh, we knew that there was volume behind them to make us feel comfortable. This is, um, this is another way to surface patterns. And it's a technique we've developed called perception uh, segmentation. In traditional segmentation studies, you know, the idea, one of the assumptions is that you, know, you do all this work and you create these models and the, the segments that you get out of that are stable over time and across contexts. We've actually found that that's not always the case and there are many aspects of consumer behavior that do change and shift across contexts. So we developed this way to kind of sort of segment things dynamically in, and in the moment to account for specific context um, context specific uh, attributes in terms of specific products or brands or where people are shopping or sort of interacting with a product or brand. So what you're seeing here is actually the output of a, a proprietary taxonomy and a clustering technique. And it starts um, by, by asking members in an open-ended way, 
uh, sort of what their, what kind of perceptions do they think are most important for this product or brand. Um, we then synthesize those open-ended comments into 20 or 25 statements, which we feed back to people in a survey. They then rate, and then we cluster them um, and come up with groups. So in this example, what we were testing for was a home improvement product. Uh, we knew that sort of people had, even within the segmentations, that there were varying degrees, even within one segment, of sort of how do-it-yourself do it people wanted to be. So we wanted to um, see sort of where, how to sort of position the product that it would appeal to some of those people. We, um, we really wanted to know not just how appealing the product was, but to, to whom um, and, and why. So what you're seeing is the output of that. Um, and essentially what we, what we found is that the red and the yellow group, which are, um, I left my glasses at home, the unsure DIYers and the, um, the eager enthusiasts were the two groups that seemed most open to this new product idea. And particularly when you look at sort of the differences down there on the bottom between the red and the yellow and the green and the blue, um, sort of the, the existing confidence in sort of um, around those two groups made, made the client think that this would be more appealing. So they were able to adjust the product and target the marketing much more specifically. All right, so this is um, another way to, um, another technique we use quite a bit, and one I'm particularly fond of. It's called emotion-centric. And one of the problems, as I'm sure you're all aware of, in asking people how appealing they think something is or how likely they will be to purchase it, is that, uh, you know, that people aren't great self, great reporters of their own behavior, predictors of their own behavior. And they can only report sort of what they know and they're kind of rationally aware of. So we spend a lot of time trying to understand and find ways to evoke what's underneath those self-reported responses. And this is one way of doing it. Um, what we do is we simply ask people, we present them with a concept or a product idea, and we ask them, how does this make you feel? And then people have to say at least six words. And this is important because if you get, usually when you're presented with something like, how does this make me feel? Well, thirsty and I wish it was colder. Like two things come up pretty easily. Six things is actually hard. So it's a little bit like drawing from the process of, um, what do you call that? Um, you sit on the couch, wow, I'm, about, I'm like actually doing it out loud. Free association, <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's the process of free association where he pushes people a little bit beyond sort of what they're consciously aware of. We also ask them then to actually say what are, create a sentence that describes uh, the reason they picked each word. And um, then we apply a lexicon to whatever they say. We've got about 20 different emotions we've identified and three groups. So everything from sort of attraction to disgust is one group feeling physiologically like relaxed or comfortable as another group, and sort of proud or sort of ashamed as like a social um, dimension there. And what you get is this visualization. This is sort of one, the, one response to a concept. And it's very, very different than um, what you'd see in a Likert type scale. Right, so you get all these nuances of sort of what was good and what was bad, and what are the um, what are the the tones like. So in this particular, this is an ad for a soft drink. So what you can see is that you know it was generally see, perceived positively. It made people feel cool. It made people feel happy. Um, they were interested, but people were also on the negative side skeptical. They were a little annoyed. Sometimes they were bored. So it was really important to the client to figure out how to minimize the negative things and adjust the messaging to sort of maximize what was good and eliminate what was bad. A lot more. Um, a lot more prescriptive than other things. For time, I'm, gonna, I'm going to skip this next example, but this is another cool thing which you can see in the paper. It kind of creates an archetype for a product and is similar to emotion-centric, so serves a similar purpose. This is um, moving on to more about validating and feedback. Uh, Max Diff, much like the, the guy who was just in here presenting at the um, um, Lev, I guess his name was, uh, our clients also asked us, why can't you do max diff in a community? And it turns out you can. So again, this is a great technique if you want to sort of sort out between a bunch of different attributes, which one is the, is sort of stand out as being the most appealing. If you just ask people how appealing are 12 different attributes, you're going to get scores like 3.2, 3.6, 3.8, and it's hard to decide. Max diff really pushes the, the variability. And what's great about this technique uh, when you're using a small sample is it's just as reliable with 50 people as it is with 150 or 300 or more. Um, you can see one of those results is for 50 people, the other for double that, um, and they are, they are essentially the same. And the last thing I'll talk about um, in any detail uh, is prediction markets. 
So prediction markets are another fast way to sort of optimize and prioritize and identify winning concepts. Uh, the theory, I, I don't know, you're probably all relatively familiar with them, but the theory behind prediction markets is that if you ask people what's going to happen, you're going to get, that's going to much more accurately predict the future than asking people what to predict what they would actually do. Um, so it incorporates gamification into the concept development process. People are given you know, a set amount of points or chits or some kind of virtual money where they can invest in what they think is going to be most successful, not for them, what they want, but in the real world. Um, once they, they can vote on things that they have a strong opinion about, uh, they can bet on things that they think are going to lose or going to win. Um, and our research and others, it's not just us, have, have shown that these are actually very, results of prediction markets are, are more accurate than regular survey um, and just asking people what's going to, to work or not work. Uh, we worked uh, with a client, um, a media and gifts company, to test this. So what they did is they launched um, five products that had performed well um, in one year. And they had all formed sort of, performed sort of similarly, right? What they wanted to do was find out, well, if we asked people, if we did prediction markets, could we best this process and see if the prediction markets did a better job of predicting how things actually did once things went to market? So we had two. We had one um, a, of the consumers and one of actually employees of the company. And we basically asked ourselves this question. So would the products perform the same way in the prediction markets as they did in the real world? And what we found is that the customer uh, prediction market actually you know, beat the average. They, they were right three out of five times. Even more interestingly is the employee market was right five out of five times. So I think when it comes to collaborating and creating new product ideas or getting insight, I think our own workforces are often sort of overlooked and the employees can actually be brought into communities uh, to, to participate in this kind of co-creative process because they're pretty smart. All right. Um, so I've talked about how to quantify things in creative ways to kind of explore data and surface patterns and bring all that sort of underlying content to light and how to sort of test and validate in ways that uh, give you sort of the sense and feeling of confidence well enough to make a decision. You can roll all this together into a product development life cycle in a way that actually can save time and money and, and cut steps from it. So this is sort of a generic model that we use, but you can see, you know, in the and this example is for a campaign, um, but it works for other things as well. So, you know, in the brief development, you can bring in things like perception segmentation or the identity elicitation to kind of open the space and identify um, unmet needs. You know, you can narrow it through a prediction market or some other kind of rational and emotional screening. You can open it back up again, um, again, by using metaphors or other kinds of, of, of techniques that I've talked about. You can close it um, and continue this sort of widening the playing field, the filtering, and the widening until you get something that you're comfortable with. Uh, we worked with a big con uh, consumer packaged goods health and beauty client to actually develop a new brand extension for one of their fragrances. They wanted to create something really new, uh, and so we actually had a community of of women, and we ran um, a bunch of really interesting activities. We had them write diaries. We had them do uh, virtual, you know, mobile ethnographies. We had them post clips of smells that interest them, anything intriguing, anything different. So there was cut grass, which is not, I guess, that interesting. But the smell of drying paint, all sorts of things came up. And it was very, very evocative, rich, qualitative data. And the client was so impressed and sort of overwhelmed and, and sort of immersed in, in these ideas for a new scent that when they went through a similar process to this, they used a prediction market, um, they did a bunch of stuff to narrow and screen, they were actually able to skip one of the qualifying quantitative steps they would normally do because they did feel confident. Um, they went through the whole process in about a third of the time. And the launch sales of the new fragrance actually exceeded the forecast. So, you know, this is, that's one example of, of many, but when you bring these methods to bear in creative ways, we do believe that they pan out and get results. And most importantly, to the point of this paper, is, you know, they do get those results in a way that's timely enough for the business to act on them. So that's, that's my thing. Do you, are there questions or is there time? We have time for one question. Unfortunately, we're running a little bit yes. behind. But will you be available for questions course, later in today? Certainly, so, and that's if, fine. All right. So. One question. We're not. Going, going. 
Hi, uh, Robert Levy. Just wondering if there are any times when communities are not ideal uh, to be used, because it kind of sounds like they could be used they for can, everything. They can be used for a lot of things, but no, they're not ideal for everything. Um, one good example is when you think about max diff, like to actually do a conjoint analysis, you know, you probably want much bigger samples and different, and they're, they're, that's a much more complicated thing. Anytime you really need to access truly a general ignorant population of your brand, just to test awareness or something like that, then you probably should go out of the way of using people that are, have been working with you closely. Or when you need to test an idea with new eyes, you know, another group, if, a, if the community's helped develop a product, then you wouldn't want to test it necessarily with that same group. You want to maybe find a different group for that. Um, so there are definitely are a couple instances where you wouldn't, when you would want to triangulate community data with other sources for sure. Thank you very much.